first of all, the, the beauty of the human person in all of their expressions. Right? And this is what, in my view, this is the deeper sense of diversity. This is what about, is to be able to look at the person, behold them, love them, value them for who they are. Now, there's a challenge that we have to do as, um, you know, with all the internal biases and different types of by how that shows up because of background. It's the nat natural thing. We're all biased in some way because just like we, we don't have a total self-awareness, we all have these biases that we have to work through because of background, because of education. And I just consider myself, since we're also this is about gratitude, I consider myself very blessed with the international intercultural experience that I've had, right? And I've had to work with people from... I would say, you know, 30, 40, 50 countries and all the continents. And, and so you learn so much. But for example, you know, when I step into the DEI educational space, in other words, I step in to get trained to be certified, right? I don't fit the mold. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. I'm your host, Candice Tridardi, and today I'm joined by Matthew Brackett. Matthew is a leadership educator and consultant with over 30 years of experience. He has held leadership roles in Italy, Ireland, England, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico, plus served as a special staff officer and chaplain in the United States Army. Matthew leverages his heart-centered care for thousands, his familiarity with complex global organizations, his broad intercultural experience and his postgraduate degrees in human development and leadership to offer a uniquely insightful perspective. His candid, sincere, and vulnerable approach to leadership will offer an enriching blend of experience, education, and inspiration. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, Candace. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, this is going to be a fun conversation. <laughs> I have so many questions I want to ask you uh, about around resilience and around DEI, but before we get into it, Let's hear from you. What is your unique story? How did you get to where you are today? Thank you. My unique story, born the 10th of 13 children. That's unique in, in and of itself. 10th of 13 from small town, New England. And not only that, my parents adopted two. Two of those 13 are adopted, which is, um, I always say that they, they had to uh, outsource to improve the quality. <laughs> and so... So yes, very, very generous. So that, that's where I'm from, small town, New England, everything, big family, but small town. And I grew up there in very faith-based origins, uh, being Catholic and wanting to do something important in, in life, something that made a difference in, in time. And as we say, also in eternity. So wanting to make a difference. And so that, that led me to, I had a restless heart. And so I really, this, I went to seminary at the age of 18 to on a, to become what they call a religious and a priest. Um, part of that was, um, I didn't know what to do with my life. So I think a part of it was escaping. I was escaping, you know, I wanted to get out of a small town in New England and do something great. So I saw this as a ticket to do that. Not the best motives to, to do what I did, but that's what I did. And, um, and that was a fascinating journey. And then, you know, 10 years of education and training in that, that brought me, I did most, I did all my philosophy and theolo theological studies in Rome, which is fascinating experience for anyone to be able to do that. Then after receiving what they call ordination as a priest, then I was, um, I, I was worked in Rome. And then, as you said, I worked in all those different countries in, in leadership roles and in ministry roles. Fascinating because when you go to different countries in, in the role of ministry, you become part of the fabric. So you're not there as a tourist. And so, you know, you speak the language, you're with the people, you understand the culture, you get really in there with, and you really become part of many people's lives. So that's what I, I did for 20 years. And part of that then was also as a chaplain in the Navy. And this is the very reduced version of my story. But under there's a, There's an underlying current going from probably 2010. Okay, the underlying sort of um i use the word current because sort of like these waves or things going on inside of me that of certain discontent of conflict with myself um which eventually leads to me putting the question on the table of am i in the wrong place um so it took me i didn't formally leave ministry until 2021 so 
there's a whole journey of search searching that goes on there and discernment and and i was i, I was in some pretty dark places um, although i continued to minister and i would like to say that i continued to minister really well but inside i was carrying around a lot of weight emotional weight emotional confusion and a crisis of identity um because i think along the journey i i lost myself in the process while i did so many other things and i fit into all these other identities I lost myself in the process. So I was on this journey also of self-discovery and of what I call coming home to myself. So in 2017, I take a sabbatical year. Um, I go into inpatient care. I put my, you know, I sign up and I sign into a clinic for, for four months to really deal with all the emotional and mental and spiritual confusion that I had and the weight and the depression and anxiety and all that. And because I needed professional help. And that's a big part of my story because to own that was very challenging and to be able to say i am not well i am sick and i need to take care of this if i want to do anything if i want to be any good to myself and to others moving forward there's and... so much there right. there's so okay. much more is there is there more to your story so, that, so i took a sabbatical year i and i was i lived with my dad my mother had since passed and so since i had been away for so many years that's why i call that year sort of that journey home to myself in many ways to, be, to reconnect with family reconnect with my roots reconnect with who i am and through a therapeutic and spiritual journey um and that brings gets me to a much better place. I stepped back into ministry to try it out again. So for me, it was a thing of honesty. I think I'm in a better spot in life. I've worked through a lot of things. I want to give it another shot. And, and then things became clear that, that just wasn't the place for me. And I had done my years of service and it was ready to move on to continue to serve people, but from uh, in a different way or from a different angle, different perspective. So there you go. I have so much I want to talk to you about now. So, um, <laughs> First of all, did you happen to listen to my interview with Brother Guy Consalmagno, the the director of the Vatican Observatory? Oh no! Oh, you oh, should I'll totally to to you go one. back and listen to that episode. It's episode one sixty nine because your story and his story have a little bit of a similarity in in your origin, right? In the church, how you uh -huh. got started in the church. Yeah. Uh, so I find that very fascinating. The two people who took divergent paths within the church. Um, had very similar ori origin stories. Interesting. I'll go back. One, 169, you said? 169, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, he's a fascinating person. Anyway, mm -hmm. okay. I want to dig into this whole thing. I, I, wow. Okay. <laughs> where I thought this conversation was going to go and where we're going to go are two different places, but let's go. So as a minister, people come to you with their problems. Right. So you are the therapist for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. So you are taking on the burden of all the things that they've got going on in their lives. So mm -hmm. kudos to you for taking, taking time to help yourself. Um, do you want to talk about, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to say this the wrong way because I don't want to diminish the role that a, a minister has, but maybe a minister isn't the right person to go to when you're struggling with, with inner demons. Right. So how do we get that message across? Right. Well, <laughs> it depends. Now, ministers, they have a role. Okay. But I, I think sometimes because they become such points of reference for their communities, um, it's very important for a person to know, let's just use myself as an example, to know when there's situations or problems or topics that I can deal with and there's other things that I'm not. And to know how to send those people to... To identify and send, but the people don't know, people in ministry don't always have that training um, on how to identify things and how to point people in the right direction for for the professional support they need. Um, I don't know if I'm answering. I'm not really answering that question. And there's certain things that a minister is is there to to work with. Um, but let's clarify your question about what you mean by dealing with inner demons. Okay, so my grandmother went to went to her priest. Mm -hmm. in the in the 1950s and said my husband is abusing me and my mm -hmm. children and right. the priest blamed it on her and said it was her fault yes so i mean that's a personal story with my own family history right so right. that's so that's a unique and a unique story and it was in the 1950s but because, possibly yeah. if you're saying i'm feeling suicidal maybe the answer isn't you need to pray more maybe the answer is you really need to go <laughs> talk to a therapist right Right. I, yes, this is such a good topic. Because I, just like we would say in ministry, I think, I think there's a lot of therapists that 
aren't necessarily good at what they do. Okay. I but agree with you. I do okay. agree with you. And um, so in any field, we, uh, people have to be really well prepared to do what they do. Now, I agree. There's, and when we talk about faith, now I'm going to go on a tangent here, but because it has to do with leadership and a lot of other stuff. But when we talk about faith, when things are not managed properly in the, in the relationship, in the faith domain, the damage goes much deeper. Um, and that's that's a topic I'm passionate about because oftentimes people in ministry don't realize that the weight that their word is given, right? Go back to this example, right? Um, or they happened, do know the weight that their word is given and they abuse it. Well, or they, yes, or they do. And then they're really in ministry for the wrong reasons. Okay. And because there's this ministry attracts, <laughs> ministry attacks people that, so people that are really wired for that and made for that, but it can also attract a lot of narcissists, a lot of people that are full of themselves because it's a platform to be able to be the center of attention and to be the point of reference. And, and it, I think it's hard. The, the discernment process needs to be improved, but I think it's also hard to, 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 to note that, that very fine line. And then, um, and then people can become that. I think when they go into ministry, if if they're not spiritually grounded and humble, then it can they can become that. They can become very self centered and, and yes. And then they they know and they and they, t- they have power over people. And we this we could you talk about that in a lot of realms, right? Even just in the public speaking realm, I, I talk about that. People that take the stage have so much. They're given so much power by the audience, and they have to use that very carefully. Okay, because people, again, they say things that are not accurate or whatever. So, but let's go back into ministry is, yes, the, the power of that. And so we, in ministry, we walk, we walk on sacred ground and we must do so with such love, with such respect, with such caution and as servants, not as masters. Um, but that gets twisted a lot as we've seen in, in many ways. But and when that happens in the faith realm, um, when leadership there's dysfunctional or toxic or just unhealthy leadership and use of power, it damages much deeper fibers of the human person. And we could say the same thing about when dynamics like that happen in the family structure as well. Or in the business structure. Or, yes. Yeah. But the, that deeper, I think in family and in faith, that there's some deeper fibers that can be that can be really touched through by abuse. Yeah. Um so yeah, this is so interesting. So yes, and a lot of people, and I get, I still get this a lot because I, you know, I hear about what, let's use the Catholic example because that's my faith background. I hear about, you know, advice the priests give. I said, and they are, it's, they're so off. Yeah. Right? And we have to be very careful because people take it very seriously. Just like what your happened to your mom. I'm sure she took that very seriously and then was living with this guilt and with shame. And then she was stuck in that relationship and and didn't make moves to couldn't yeah. make moves. Right? Well, my mom was a child at the time and he she was being abused by her stepfather. Oh, so right. this was my grandmother that was, had been told that she wasn't a good enough wife. So that's I mean, okay. that's generations ago. Yeah. Um, I mean, the 1950s was 70 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, I was also raised in in the Catholic faith. Faith. I call myself a Reformed Catholic, though. Um, <laughs> right. Yes. And, but uh, so I, I understand that perspective, I, and I really don't know a lot about other Christian religions. I, I've mm-hmm. done a lot of research into other religions, like Buddhism sure. and and Hinduism and and, and uh, Islam. I because I'm fascinated by the commonalities of all religion, mm-hmm. and um, especially how Buddhism is like this overarching. Um, like umbrella and then everything right. underneath it. I mean, I, people don't want to hear that, but it, it's really true. Buddhism is like the umbrella and everything else is underneath it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Buddhism, But that's my perspective. No, it is. But, but Buddhism was, it would also be considered a philosophy in which would, which would understandably make it an overarching because it's a philosophy that applies to human beings. Correct. In all times and all places. So I think. Correct. Yes. Yeah, con- yeah, that's true. So Buddhism and Confucianism are philosophies, not religions. That is true, but some people don't n- understand the difference. Right. No. They, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So very um, well said. Thank you, Candice. Well, thank, thank you. So, so understanding that that is where I'm coming from. <laughs> this is a very interesting conversation for me. So you went and sought help because you knew that you weren't in the right place to get the help that you needed. Mm-hmm. That's resiliency because you understood that you needed help. So ta- let's talk about resiliency. Let's just mm-hmm. pivot to resiliency. <laughs> talk yes. to me about that. 
resilience is another topic that I'm I'm passionate about. Um, you let me know where we want where you want to go with this, but I initially I would say you know there's different ways to define resilience, and that's the simplest thing is sort of like this ability to bounce back and or to bounce back better or to bounce back bounce beyond right, but. I, in in resilience, we have to be very careful not to compare ourselves with others because we all have different levels of resilience. Okay, sometimes we can compare ourselves and that doesn't do anyone any any favors because we think, well, I need to be like that or I need to be like that. No. No, in a resilient is like many things, resilience has it's there's different pieces to the puzzle. And we won't get into all the different pieces right now, but but a lot of it has to do with my own self-awareness, how I, my knowledge of myself, my awareness of myself, and then the ability to navigate that in a healthy and an appropriate way. Then it's how to navigate also my surroundings, right? So there's the whole thing around awareness, self-knowledge and knowledge of others and all that is, is part of the resilience because it's only when we, we're aware can we, then we know how to address situations and circumstances, right? And also to know our limits, you know, so setting boundaries and knowing our limits is also part of that. Healthy lifestyles, routines, and, and all habits, right, is also, all, these are all little things that build up the muscles of resilience. And, and sometimes we don't pay attention to those. And, uh, most of us aren't self-aware. Yes. <laughs> I mean, self-awareness is the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy, right? So most of us don't get there. Right. Yes. So self-aware, it's a funny thing because as human beings, we all think we, we, <laughs> we're we self-aware, right? That we know ourselves perfectly and we have the whole picture. And, but we know also know that's not true, right? That we all have blind spots. And then, and I love this because, for example, in this conversation, right, I, I am discovering myself through you. Right? As human beings, this is what we need. That's mm -hmm. why we, we, we are relational beings. So I discover myself through Candace, through your eyes, through the, your knowledge of me, through what you see. Now, that's that's still only one part of the picture, right? Then there's everything. Else. But that's part of, that just proves our blind spots and how we get to know ourselves. We we can't know ourselves only through ourselves. We can know ourselves through others. And then obviously through situations and circumstances. That is the perfect lead into DEI. Because um, you talk <laughs> about holistic DEI, right? The, yes, the, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's right. Um, I would love to hear your perspective on what that looks like holistically, because what you just said perfectly led into that. We can't <laughs> we can't know ourselves unless we know what other people think of us, and you don't know what other people think of you unless you have a diverse people around you mm -hmm. giving you feedback. That's right. my opinion, but what's yours? All right, no, and seeing ourselves through the eyes of others, right? And this cultural eyes, right? Then there's just everyone has different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. And when I talk about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's a few things that we want to begin with. First of all, there's um, there's a lot of idea ideological and political twists into the DEI space, so it, it becomes a very um, touchy topic. Um, because in my view, some of it is it begins with erroneous foundations um, based on Marxism, right? And so we have to be careful with that because it's very subtle, okay? And it's not. this is not totally a critique on Marxism as such, but when we begin with erroneous foundations, then obviously then things, they go, they're not strong foundations, things go off. Yeah. So um, without getting into all of that, I would just say that I believe, and, I'm, and because of my in intercultural and international experience in ministry, but dealing with people of all classes and ages and colors and, and sexual you know, um, orientations and all that stuff. Is, I mean, as, I and I can, as a chaplain in the Navy, you dealt with different faiths, uh, faiths as well. Of course. One chaplain, chaplain multi-faith in the, in the military. I worked at a base of 5,000 Marines and sailors, and I was the only chaplain. And I took care of everyone. And I was there to safeguard their religious liberties, to make sure they had access to their religious liberties, and to and care for them as human beings, first and foremost, and then human beings in that specific environment, and also then to advise all the commanders that I served. So the so most yes. powerful moment I've ever had in terms of understanding the, the diversity of what of the United States is my mother is buried in a national cemetery because my father well, served in during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So um, he it's his plot, but he, your wife can be buried with you right, right at the national cemeteries. So my father's still alive. My mother was buried first. But as I walked 
along the cemetery, you know, and looked at all the gravestones, the number of different religions represented in that cemetery was overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Over- and, and the ethnicities, the last names of these soldiers, right. they were all different ethnicities. America is this huge, ginormous melting pot, and we are giving ourselves a disservice. This is my opinion. Yeah. If we don't embrace that. Right. Okay. Sorry Definitely. I interrupted you, but I no, wanted no, to. I wanted- Thank you. No, that's so beautiful. That's such a beautiful image, right? And and going back to my military service, same thing, huge. And I wanted to minister in a diverse environment. So that's partly why I went into that, that ministry. Um, so when we talk about diversity, the ENI, we there's surface level diversity, and then there's deep level diversity. The the problem in the in the DEI space is that the metrics. And make it difficult because the metrics only measure the surface level, right? And so I think it does a dis- disservice because if that's the only thing we're going by, then we might not have such my such my daughter. My daughter is a Korean American Latino Latina. Right, right. I mean, you can't get more <laughs> diverse than that. <laughs> right. She has a lot of boxes that she checks when they ask her what her ethnic background is. <laughs> right, right. And that's and there's a surface level to that, right? I use the example in a boardroom. We could have people of all different colors, religions, and sexual orientations, genders, whatever, but they could all think the same way, right? Uh, according to the metrics, there's diversity, no. right? Yeah. So, so there's a deeper level, and people don't always pay attention to that because of the met- it's for it's hard to measure the deeper level. So, but that's important to take into account. It's also important that when we look at something, just to assume that when everyone is the same color. Or even the same then there, there still could be diversity there. We can't necessarily we can't necessarily assume that there's no diversity. Okay. Um I use well, myself as within example. a family, you have diversity of thought of and, and Every, beliefs. Yes. You know, my sisters and I do not have the same religious beliefs. Right, right. You know, we have yeah. three three sisters, three different religious beliefs right. within one family raised by the same two parents. Mm-hmm. And then parents are fascinated by how each child each child is so different. Right, They're like where'd this child come from? Right? <laughs> Everyone's just so different, and there's such a beauty to that, and that's why I want to focus on is first of all the the beauty of the human person in all of their expressions, right? and this is what, in my view, this is the deeper sense of diversity. This is what I'm about is to be able to look at the person, behold them, love them, value them for who they are. Now, there's a challenge that we have to do as, um, you know, with all the internal biases and different types of by how that shows up because of background. It's the natural thing. We're all biased in some way because just like we we don't have a total self-awareness, we all have these biases that we have to work through because of background, because of education. And I just consider myself, since we're also this about gratitude, I consider myself very blessed with the international intercultural experience that I've had, right? And I've had to work with people from... I would say, you know, 30, 40, 50 countries in all the continents. And, and so you learn so much. But for example, you know, when I step into the DEI educational space, in other words, I step in to get trained to be certified, right? Um, I don't fit the mold. Right? I am a white heterosexual cisgender male. Right? And the way people dealt with me and looked at me when I was like, what are you doing here? Which also speaks to another type of bias, right? Yeah, it does. And that's so, unfortunate. No, but but yeah, but we all, it's something we all deal with. And so, but I think just the human person, as a country, we still have a lot to do because we are superficial. We, yeah. we may, we're judgmental. We, we, a lot of times we focus on the externals. And, and another example, as going back to my ministry, you know, you know the priests hear confessions and things like this. So, you know, someone comes to confession who, didn't fit the mold, right? Long hair, tattoos, earrings, and all this, and everything going on, everything that you would think, well, this per- the most beautiful soul, one of the most beautiful souls I've ever encountered. Right? And that was a lesson for me. Right? And I learned early on in ministry that I can never judge. Yeah. And I am grateful for that. Yeah. My favorite story about this, and I'm sure he'll be he'll he'll be fine with me sharing it. So uh, I have a friend named Rashid, and Rashid is um, very spiritual. And he was talking to another man, and and the man said, "You are one of the the best Christian men I know." And Rashid said, "That's interesting because I'm Muslim." 
And so it's also about perspective, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. It's also about perspective. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, I love that story because he really is one of the most spiritual people I know, kind, mm-hmm. kind, you know, um, so yeah, it, it's, it was a very interesting story. And I, I wonder if it changed the other man's perspective, mm-hmm. because again, we see ourselves through our own lens. But it's when we can see ourselves through others, like you said mm-hmm. earlier, yeah. is we can really, is when we really know ourselves. And so, yeah, that, that person makes like all of us, we can make assumptions. Yeah. Right? He made an assumption that if he's spiritual, then that person must be Christian. Not, there's, there's a lot of spiritual and well-connected people to the transcendent that, that aren't Christian. Yeah. It's interesting. Okay. So let's go back to DEI, DE and I for a minute. So how, okay. So this, the audience for this show are micropreneurs, solopreneurs, people who are doing mm-hmm. their own marketing, uh, mm-hmm. maybe some micro influencers, um, you know, which are, um, you know, influencers that don't have a million followers. So that's right. who's listening right now. And when I say solo micro, I mean, we're talking people who work by themselves. So how can people who work by themselves incorporate some of these ideas about DEI, about resilience, ab- about multiculturalism into what they're doing, even though they work by themselves? Mm-hmm. I know that's yes. a hard question for you, but it I'm laying it on, I'm laying it on the table for you. you. Put me on the spot here, but it's, but as you know, first of all, you have to know your audience, right? And so I would encourage them to. And to to un- try to see what by you know are they when they focus on an audience, are they limiting themselves? You know when, right? I think well no we I can broaden my audience, the people that I want to reach to, and how am I going to do that? How am I going to either the product or my message? How am I going to speak to people of other cultures, of other mentalities, of other backgrounds? That's one thing. And then I I am a firm believer in access or contact with, to go out there. And step out of your, I could say comfort zone, or step out of your normal circles and step into diverse circles where you can meet people where they're at, understand them, because that will also feed that other aspect about your messaging and your, your who you want to sell to or who, who your people are. But you're going to broaden that when you start to meet many more people. So in here, I'll just focus on the surface stuff. You know, go meet people of different color, people of different languages, cultural backgrounds, meet people of different sexual orientations and or identify differently in their genders. Or Go out there, meet, understand them, meet them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that joining a chamber of commerce as a solopreneur is a great, and I, I should practice my own, practice what I preach. <laughs> but if you are a solopreneur and you join a chamber of commerce, you will be exposed to people of different face. Mm-hmm. Um, ethnic backgrounds, you know, belief systems, all that, because a chamber encompass, encompasses all business owners within an area. Right. So yeah, that, yeah. that's a, a great, just, you know, if that's the first thing that you, you do or the only thing you do, then you're going to meet other people. You're going to meet other people. Yes. And even go to different churches, not because you have to necessarily agree, but you go there to understand why they believe what they believe, yeah. why they practice how they practice. My daughter was in. Uh, my daughter is in graduate school now, but when she was in college, she had an assignment, and I I think it was a, a history class to go to a church, to to visit a church that she didn't belong to, like mm-hmm. a, a different faith than she did. Right. And so we chose the closest church to us, um, and it was really interesting in that the the minister was actually also. Um, formerly Catholic and had changed religions because he fell in love with a woman and wanted to get married. Um, so there's so many interesting stories about Catholic priests. Right? <laughs> but so he was the, the the minister for this church. I can't remember what kind of church it was. Um, it's just down the street. I should, I should know because I see it every day. Right. Um, but he spent some time talking to Dorothy about, uh, about his religion and how it compared to other religion. And it was just mm-hmm. really, and it, you know, if you, if you just ask, I mean, she right. told him straight up, I'm here because of a college assignment. And he took the time to talk to her about Wonderful. his faith and his religion and his church. And mm-hmm. it was really nice. People will give you their time if you ask them. Yes. yes That's an important lesson. It is. Sometimes we hold ourselves back either by whatever prejudices we might have or assumptions. Or you know, we hold ourselves back by thinking that oh, people don't have time or not interested or they're going to be offended or whatever other things that can get in the way. Yeah. The worst thing that can happen is people will say, no, they're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know. Yeah. So what do you do? What's your, um, what do you do when you're out there working? What, what, who are you helping when you work when in your field? 
Yes, but I think because of my vast background, there's a lot of people that come to me. And really, by I market myself. I'm, I look to serve more people in senior leadership roles. And to meet that, that at that intersection between their personal and professional, I would even call it like a sort of a holistic approach to leadership coaching. And I call myself more than an executive coach because we look at both, right? We deal with the personal and professional and how you, and leadership is sort of that, uh, again, holistic approach of how I lead myself, how I lead in my inner circles and with uh, of influence, and then how I lead professionally and in organizational contexts yeah so so there's like different levels to that leadership and all things and then there's a there's a there's a coaching element i really firmly believe in the art of coaching but then there's there's a mentorship element to it and there's a consulting and educational element to it oh let's break that down let's define all four of those things <laughs> okay well boy i didn't study for this in truth. but yeah <laughs> so coaching <laughs> coaching is the art of very attentive listening and curious and powerful questioning with the conviction that the client has the answers inside of them. So I facilitate a process to try to draw those answers out through listening and questions. So you have to be tuned in now. So the powerful thing about it is when someone finds their answers, it's very powerful. It's transforming. Oftentimes it's we switch very easily as human beings to advice mode. Well, what I think is, and what you should do is, oftentimes that's that's not transformative, All right? And it doesn't do it. And then the person doesn't feel listened to, doesn't feel understood. I have to many times I've shifted to that in short conversations because I think I don't have time to do all the other things, so I shift to that. So that's coaching. Mentorship is more about um, where I've been in certain places or been in roles, and so then you share experiences of how you did it or what you lived or whatever. Consulting is then more from an area of expertise um, in education. Is this is my these are my areas of expertise, and so I can offer you advice and, and to, to to whatever situations you're going on 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 how to deal with situations. So very situational. That's how I would explain all those in the in the shortest way possible. I think we missed uh, training or education. Oh, no, I know. Well, I, I mixed it with um. I mixed it with consulting. Okay. So education. I love the word education. I use it when I say that I'm an educator. Because if I said if I'm a speaker, I, I just think that's that can be shallow. While there's a lot of power in speaking when you're a good public speaker, um, there's that's very powerful. But I, education is is this, it's the ability to lead people out of themselves, you know, it's coming from the Latin word, what that means to really to to lead people out of themselves into new areas. Yeah. And, and so I, I I use the word educator because it's it's more than a speaker. I, I, I try to use solid concepts, build build speaking on very solid foundational concepts. That so I would never say that I'm a more motivational speaker. I might be a motivational educator. Yeah. And, because motivation speaks to the emotions. Um, and I want to speak to emotions, but I also want to speak also to the intellect and to the mind. That word educator isn't sitting with me because when I think of educator, I think of college professor or kindergarten teacher. Right. Um, what What's another word we can use? Because I also have a problem with public speaker. Like I don't, right. want, you know, even though I do some speaking, I don't really like saying I'm a speaker. So. I, mm -hmm. I, but I kind of don't want to say educator either because I don't want people to think, oh, she's a teacher. Well, I don't, I don't qualify as, right. you know, I don't, I'm not a teacher. Um, yes. So That's very well said. What is, mm. what, you know, and I love the word edification, but a lot of people use it in the wrong way. Right. Um, so edification has become, has, has, be, has come to mean to build up instead of to educate, um, which is, you know, the root mm -hmm. word, the Latin root right. of, of it is to educate. But it, mm -hmm. you know, which is also building up, I guess. That's right. Um, so I don't know. What is another word? Mm. Let's solve this problem together, Matthew. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, so uh, what have I heard before? Uh, you know, motivational teacher. I've heard that a motivational. Mm, th then there's been a plan where it's, but it's not coming to me now We're between speaker and educator. Speak yeah. educator. No, but <laughs> there's a question for the audience. All right, listener, what is the word that you think we should be using here? Head over to the show notes and leave a comment.
Yes. If you uh, if you don't want to head to the show notes, you can uh, look at, look for good pods because good pods has a way for you to interact with the show as well. So look for this episode of Gratitude Geek on Good Pods, or head over to the website mm. gratitudegeek.com, find the episode, and leave your thoughts about what the word is that we're looking what, for. The, what is the best term that capsula encapsulates what a a speaker and an educator is? That right? Yeah, a speaker without and using a, those words. Yeah, a person who it's not lecturer. Mm-hmm. It's not right. lecturer. It's something else. All there's right. there's something else. But I totally get what you're saying. And I'm on the same page as you. Public speaker doesn't resonate with me. Educator doesn't re- resonate with me. Teacher doesn't resonate with me. But there is something that's going to resonate. So audience, I'd love to hear your feedback. And I'm going to share it with Matthew too. Please. So let us know. Let us know what you think. Okay. Um, we... Are I sorry? I have a hard stop, and we so we need to to. We've got about ten minutes left. I'd love to hear. Um, let's talk about marketing because most of po- folks tuning in also want to know about marketing. So, as do in the realm of what you're doing now, how do you get your word out? How do you get? How do you let people know what you're doing? Yes, thank you. And I I will profess that I am not uh, a good marketer. <laughs> okay, and I'm not a good seller. <laughs> So it's a muscle. You're that not I a never... good marketer. You're not a good speller. A seller. Oh, seller. So, so those are things I never had to do. Um, and it just sort okay, of I, sit with my. I am going to completely disagree with you 100% on sales. <laughs> okay. Good. You are a salesperson. You sold every time you stood on a pulpit. That's right. And preached. That's right. Right. I did. You sold every time that you helped somebody in your capacity as a as a minister. You are selling them on the idea of finding their faith. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. So there you go. Yeah. So, so yes. erase Maybe that. Erase I that will, from your from okay. your brain. I will embrace that. I am a, yes. I I suppose I have sort of resistance to towards certain sale strategies. Yeah. Right? And so that's maybe why I don't want to identify as selling yes. is educating. It really that's is. Right. It is. So all you're doing is educating the consumer on the product or the service that you're offering and on the value, right? The and value on the value that's in it for them. Yes. Mm-hmm. So well said. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I, what I do is I'm so on social media, I have a, I have a strategy of really, I think consistency is really important. So cons- first of all, clarifying the message, which took me a while because I wanted to do all kinds of things. And so I had to sort of say, all right, I need to focus, right? I began to see value in that. So clarifying the message and then consistency in the messaging. Uh, now I use social media. Now, a lot of, I don't expect to get a lot of coaching clients through that. I prefer to get those. I expect to get those through word of mouth um, to personal references. But for my education, speaking or whatever that word is, um, uh, social media is very important nowadays because that's what people will look at and how much of a following, how much influence do they have, how well known are they. So I'm trying to build that up in, as a way to, to sort of create visibility and credibility. So I, I want to go back to this word of mouth. How yes. you, because that is the number one way to get good clients. Mm-hmm. If you want to get an, if you have an awesome client that you love working with and you want to meet more people like them, that client that you worked with that you loved working with needs to tell other people about you. Right. Mm, so yes. how are you going about that? <laughs> I have to, I'm just, I'm beginning. I'm just beginning. So I, I don't have a whole lot of success stories to tell you. Um, but I do, I can say that the clients that I have worked with have had very good experiences. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I trust that they will pass the word to the right people. Okay, you're trusting. That's your that's faith. Your that's faith. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, as someone who has been marketing for twenty, no, oh, for thirty <clears throat> something oh, years. Oh boy! <laughs> so, oh my gosh, am I that old? Um, you have to ask. Yes. So here's what I did when I was. Um, my husband is a world class furniture maker. He's retired now, but mm. he made he made uh, handcrafted beds for people who collected antique furniture. So he made antique looking beds and king, king size beds for people who collected antique furniture. You cannot find a king size bed as an antique because they didn't right. have king size beds back in the day. So he mm. had to, he made a bed for a modern mattress that matched their furniture. It was a highly niche market. And uh, a lot of his clients were movie stars, fortune 500 executives. And so um, this is how I did the word of mouth, right? Mm-hmm. I sent a thank you card. And in that thank you card, I included a gift. And I just said, we would love to see 
what your new bed looks like in your home, please send a picture. Mm. And they would text pictures to me and tell me how yummy the sea salt car- caramels were that they received along with their thank you card. Right. And so, uh, and along with that, they would also talk about how much they love their new bed. So I gathered testimonials from these clients who allow me to use their name. Some of them are famous, right? And then I put those on our website and shared mm. those testimonials. Right. And then they, you know, or or sometimes they would even post to social media. That was always the best. Right. Here's a picture of my new bed on social media. So that is that's asking for the word of mouth. Yes. But it's it's leveraging the happy clients. Mm-hmm. Leveraging. So I, I know that what you do is not a physical product and you can't ask for a photo, but right. you can ask for the Google review, or you can ask for, um, I, would you mind helping me uh, create a portfolio of testimonials Mm -hmm. that I can share with future clients? And if you did a great job, they're going to be happy to do that. Right. Yes. Yes. I want to improve on the ask. And I was just thinking about that these, these last few days of reaching out to people and doing that. So yes, thank you for encouraging me and clarifying how important (laughs) it is. But the ask I remember hearing about your thank you notes and all that on another podcast that you did. It's wonderful. Yeah. I thank you. It, it, the power of just sending a thank you card is so remarkable. Mm. I mean, and that comes back to gratitude. That's why I'm the gratitude geek, That's right? Because right. <laughs> the thank you card, let me tell you, if you go into the habit of either saying thank you or sending thank you cards, you you won't have to ask for business because you're going to get it anyway. Right. So um, I also have a gratitude practice that I'm sure you're going to appreciate because of where you are in the world. Um, so at 1234 every day, an alarm goes off on my phone and I say five things out loud that I'm grateful for, or mm. I send five text messages to five different people telling them how much I appreciate them. That's happens wonderful. every day. And I learned that from Anthony Paponi, who was right. a previous uh, interview on this podcast. Okay. 12, so, why 1234? One, two, three, four, five oh, okay. things I'm grateful for. Oh, that for. makes sense. Isn't that cool? Isn't that a great <laughs> yeah. gratitude practice? It is good. And it's <laughs> gratitude is so as you, I mean, I'm not I'm preaching as I say, preaching to the choir here about just the importance of gratitude, how good it is for the soul, for the spirit, for your emotional life, but how good it is for other people. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. do you have a gratitude practice that you have? First of all, I think with people, um I try to be very gracious and thankful. You know, anyone I meet on the street, people that I see clean in the street or clean in, you know, the whatever. I, I always, Hey, thank you for what you're doing. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm sure everyone's doing it because it's their duty, but, um, but I also believe that thanking people for who they are, for what they do is really important. So I, I, I do actually, and actually someone said to me the other day, you say thank you too much. Right. <laughs> and I, I don't said, think well, that's possible. Right. It's part of who I am. Right? I think people, are, if they're not used to it, they can find it um, kind of awkward or they don't know what to do when you say thank you. Right. So it puts them in an awkward position, but, um, but I gratitude and you might like this phrase is the rarest of flowers in the garden of virtues. Oh, I love that. Gratitude is the rarest of flowers in the garden of virtues. (laughs) I love that. And I love that you say thank you to people for just doing their job. Um, I don't know. Have you ever been to India? Do you want, I mean, the caste system in India had the untouchables who did all the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And even though it's a caste system that doesn't really exist anywhere else, I mean, right. it does exist. We have a mm-hmm. caste system here in the United States and people who take out the guard, you know, the garbage men mm-hmm. and the, and the people who clean the streets and the, those people are, um, you know, people who pick vegetables in the fields. They are, they have a very important job that the rest of us couldn't live our lives without. And nobody right. ever says thank you to them. So mm-hmm. You know, I love the idea of being more on purpose about saying thank you to people for doing their job. Yes. You know, really appreciate it. And again, this goes back to the dignity of what we're talking about, the dignity of each person and the dignity of work. There's no job that's better than other or higher or lower. It's just, we are all doing our little bit to. Imagine if the people who are responsible for picking the vegetables and the fruit stopped working. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about that. (laughs) <laughs> or the people who process meat, if they stopped working. Right. All you have to think about is what happened when the chicken that we had a aviary flu take out, you know, a huge population of chickens last year. That's right. right? <laughs> think about that. Mm. Imagine that happening across all fruits and vegetables and all meat. Right. Right. So we yeah. should really appreciate the people who do that work. When I lived in Rome, 
Um, I lived there for a number of years and the garbage people would go on strike every once in a while. So what happened? There was piles of garbage all over the place. Yeah. Right? So it's about, yeah, the dignity of work and then how people need to be receive the just compensation for what they do. This is completely off topic. And I can't remember if it's Amsterdam. It's I think it's Denmark. Denmark has this system where they put these underground trash receptacles um, so they don't do pick up. They don't pick up the trash from your house. Have you been to mm-hmm. Denmark? I have not. Okay. So they don't pick up the trash in front of your house. You're responsible for taking your trash to one of these receptacles and mm-hmm. they have them everywhere. Like they're on right. every corner. Right. So there are these underground receptacles and you go and you put your trash in and then they have recycle. And then this truck comes and picks up the receptacle, dumps it and takes it away. And you don't ever see any trash anywhere because it's all underground. Right. And they don't have a mouse, you know, a rat problem a rat, rat, or a rat. raccoon problem because all the trash is underground. And those, yeah, the Nordic countries, they have so much that we can all learn from. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, how do we go down the trash conversation? <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's just I, about people doing their job and appreciating what everyone does. Yeah. Yes. And which we should all do. Um, and so I, I, an appreciation, I really appreciate this conversation. I really wish that I didn't have to cut it short because I've learned a lot from you today and I very much enjoy chatting with you. So, we, but we do need to wrap up. So this is your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? Thank you. Wow. I would have to say there's, there's a few things. I, I'm thankful for so many people in my life that I've come across, people that have allowed me into their life, people that have trusted me to hold the sacredness of whatever they're going through. Um, and also people that have supported me, right? And during those those times of challenge, of difficulties, I, you know, while I, many people leaned on me, you know, they leaned on my shoulder. They used, I used, you know, they used my hand. I lifted them up with my arms and my hand. I walked to them with my feet. I, I was the smile for them. I was the encouraging word. But then during my times of crisis and, and darkness, so many other people were that for me. And I'm very thankful to them. And maybe this is people out there that I've never thanked them or I never noticed because of what I was going through. I didn't notice the extra effort that they made to care. So I, I'm thankful for those people. And I want to say a quick word on, on interdependence without getting too complex. But when we look at creation, everything in creation or in the world, we all, everything needs each other. And as human beings, well, there's part of us that likes to be independent and not need anybody. There's, we all need each other. And there's a beauty to that. And there's a grounding element to that. There's a humility to that. And, but there's also a fulfillment in that. And so we all need each other. And I want to be thankful for the people that have allowed me into their life when they needed me. And the people that I've been able to lean on when I needed them. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building lasting, genuine relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Make sure to visit gratitudegeek.com for their show notes where you can find links to all the groovy resources we've mentioned, including ways to connect with our guest, Matthew Brackett. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Audible, iTunes, Good Pods, or your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rep Brocken Solidly. I'm your host, Candice Fidardi, reminding you that gratitude is like manure. It's just a pile of poo until you spread it around. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. <laughs>